listen up. And listen up to lift our voice and change. To the living God. To the living God. No one can deny. No one can deny that Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is. So we've been going through now eight weeks of a series that is focused on worship. And we've looked at worship from every angle possible. We started out building the foundation for the series. We looked at the very first worshiper, which was Lucifer. We saw how Lucifer began to worship himself too much, and it eventually got him kicked out of heaven. We looked at how he got kicked out of heaven, landed on earth, and in the Garden of Eden, he was able to fool Eve and to... Uh, into worshiping what she thought was worshiping, you know, knowledge, but really it was about her, right? It's what we, what we started to see. And what we started to learn is really our biggest, hardest test in, when it comes to worship is putting yourself below God. Same thing that happened to Lucifer is the same thing that we struggle with is what we learn. We begin to look at Jesus and he began to teach us about worship. And he met this lady at the at the uh, at, at the well and he teaches her a powerful lesson on worship. He says that God is looking for some worshipers, but he's looking for people who will worship him in what spirit and truth. So we started to dig into that. What does it mean to to worship in spirit and truth? And what Jesus shows us. Is that true worship, spirit and truth worship, I'm talking about the real deal worship, it comes from the heart. It's not what you say, it's not what you do, it's not where you go, it's not any of that stuff. What it is, is a, it is a relationship with God where you do those three things that he want, want us to do. Do anybody remember those three things? Anybody? All right. We, got, we have to be thankful. That's all God wants for us is to be thankful. The, the second thing that he wants for us is to come to, uh, is to honor our vows. And then the final thing he wants us to do is to what? Come to him when we're in trouble. That's all God. That is, and, that, and he says, if you do that, you will honor me. That is worship, but that is hard. And Jesus begins to reel that, re reveal that as he begins to show us that it takes a true heart in order to worship God. And Jesus begins to use this term. Hypocrite. And what he's talking about, he's talking about people who do things on the outside, but on the inside, they don't, they're not very thankful. They actually think that they did it for themselves. He, they, they, they say things on the outside, but on the inside, they really don't keep their vows. They say things on the outside, but when they get in trouble, they try to figure it out for themselves. They go to man, they go anywhere. They turn to whatever in the world is easiest and most accessible, and they will not wait on the word of God to speak to them. So then we start to move into the expressions of worship. Now, this is what we commonly associate with worship. The things that we see on the outside, we start to look at those expressions of worship. Quinn did a great job of explaining to us that first expression, and that's praise. That's what we do for God. He doesn't have to do anything for us to get up and what? Clap our hands, for us to, to uh, sing out our praises to him, for us to dance for him. He's already done everything he needs to do, and he, he's worthy of that. And then last week we looked at praying and fasting. And so I began to, to think about this last week as, 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 as we were sitting back in the office, uh, one and Quinn and I were talking, and God began to reveal some things to me that have impacted us in some ways. Last week when we talked about praying and fasting, God was clearly telling us that we're not supposed to do that to get attention. Right. We're not supposed to pray loud like he said, like the hypocrites, we're not supposed to try to be out front when we pray. And we fast. He said, we're not supposed to walk around saying, oh, I'm so hungry. Oh, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I'm fasting for the Lord. He said that those things are hard things that we should keep on the inside. But sometimes we struggle with praise. Now, don't we? And, and what God began to reveal to my heart was we struggle with this because of the way we were raised. So let me tell you what I mean by that. If you were like me, you were raised in a church or you went to the church for the first time, your mom or somebody looked at you with a stern face and told you to sit down and don't make a sound. 
And if you made noise, you went to the bathroom. And it, it wasn't because you had to go. You didn't want to go. By the, time, by the time you figured out where you were going, you, you, it was too late. And over multiple days and months and, and Sunday after Sunday and Wednesday night meetings and all types of church events, you were trained to sit in the sanctuary and be quiet. That impacts you today. That training over your entire youth impacts you today. And let me tell you how you know it impacts you because when you got older and you saw other people who were praising and worshiping from their heart, you thought they were crazy, didn't it? Oh, that's the crazy lady right there. She just, she's going to cry right now. I know this is about the time for her. And the, and the real issue was you had been taught that you're not supposed to do these kind of things. You can't cry in church. If you cry in church, we're going to the bathroom, right? If you talk in church, going to the bathroom. And even during the praise and worship times of the service, nobody ever told you, okay, it's okay for you. Nobody ever trained you. It's okay for you to get up now and clap or, or you can yell all you want to, make as much noise as you want to. Now, the contrary happens for prayer and for fasting. First of all, let's look at prayer. Somebody set you down and taught you how to say grace. And what did they do when you said grace? Yay, everybody look, yay! Somebody set you down and they, now I lay me down to sleep, I praise the Lord my soul to keep, and if I die before I wait, praise the Lord my soul to take. And the time you got half, you didn't even have to get all the way through it. You got halfway through that thing, your mom was sitting there with tears in her eyes, your daddy was. <laughs> so, so the thing that we're supposed to keep on the inside, the praying thing, you were rewarded over and over again. Hey, everybody, come on, who going to say great? Hey, can we let, can we let my daughter say crazy? <laughs> Oh, my son say grace. I, I want them to say it. And then when they say it, what does everybody in the house do? Yay! And you begin to develop a mentality by which the things that should be on the inside are on the outside, and the things that should be on the outside are on the inside. And what Jesus called this, if you remember from our study, this is called the tradition of men. This is what he's talking about. Because you have created some traditions and because in those traditions you have decided that we're going to praise a person when they do this loud, eloquent prayer. And listen, let me tell you something. There are too many people, I'm releasing somebody right now, who are ashamed and scared to say prayers in public as adults because you did not receive what you needed when your parents were, they were so happy when other people said the prayer. They weren't happy when you said it. They just kind of like, uh. I'm releasing somebody today. Listen, you are fully equipped to pray to God. You are fully equipped to praise God. You don't have to sit in your seats. You're a big girl now, big guy now. We can, you can get up and you can praise God with your heart. Do not allow the traditions of man to separate you any longer Amen. from what is due to God. Amen? Amen. So we, we go into... Matthew chapter 6, you know, chapter 5 and chapter 6 is this Sermon on the Mount, best sermon of all time, way better than any sermon I'm going to do up here. Jesus really walks us through the entire religion. He goes into chapter 6, and what he begins to show us is the ways in which we worship. He says when, very important thing, because see, we don't fast. But, God, but Jesus says to us, when you fast, that implies that we're supposed to be fasting. He says, when you pray, that implies that we're supposed to be praying. Now, we know that we're supposed to be praying all the time, but we don't always subscribe to this fasting thing. I think some of us probably thought that that went away with the sacrifices and the bulls and all that stuff. But what Jesus says to us, and I just want to reiterate this, when you fast, we're supposed to be fasting. And as a church, we will be a fasting church. We will fast four times a year as not always 21 days. <laughs> the victory, right? As a church, we will be a praying church. I'm praying right now that God will begin to allow people to have the spirit to fill that prayer box up. Listen, if you're struggling with anything, the last thing in that list was to bring it to God. That's what he's talking about. Put it in the prayer box. I'm praying right now over getting a prayer ministry started. We have got, let me tell you something. We may not have a lot of money. We may not have a lot of people, but we have an unlimited supply of prayer. Amen. 
But Jesus also introduces one more thing that we're supposed to do. Let's look at the scripture real quick. Uh, today I want to talk with you about expressions of worship, and this expression is going to be generosity. We want to talk about what it means to be a giver. What does God re require of us from, from giving? And it starts right at the top of this, uh, of Matthew chapter 6. He says in verse 1, he says, be careful. Listen, be careful. Not to practice your righteousness, your, your acts of giving or whatever it is that you're doing. Whatever it is that you do to appear to be righteous, whatever you do out there in, in, in the, in, in the, at your job and at home, be careful in the spirit in which you do that. And this is very important. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Let me stop you right there for a second. He's not telling us not to be righteous. He's not telling us not to practice righteousness. He's not telling us to fit in with everybody and do things that we see everybody's doing. That is not what he's saying here. But what he's saying here, when you're being righteous, you need to check your heart and make sure that you're doing it for God and you're not doing it for man. What Jesus is speaking to here is the motive. The motive by which we do anything. He says, if you do, you will have no reward from your father. Listen, if you go out being righteous just so people can say, hey, good job. Hey, you did a great job. Hey, that was a great prayer. Hey, that was I saw you fasting. That was awesome. I'm so proud of you. That's the reward that you receive. And that thing that you were fasting for and that thing that you were praying for. What Jesus says is the father is not going to give you that. You got it. You've already got it. When they when they clapped and they stood up and they acknowledged you. That was it. If that was the reason by which you did it. Now listen, I'm not telling you not to strive for excellence. I'm not telling you not to go out. I want you to fill your wall up with awards in the service that you're doing for the kingdom at work or any other place. But what I'm telling you is we do not do to get. We do because we love Christ. The reason why we pray is because we love God and we want a relationship with him. We do not pray so that people can look at us and think, man, that guy's a, that lady's a really good prayer. The reason why we fast is not so that we can be known as the, the church that fasts. We fast because we're breaking yokes within this community. We're changing our lives. We're going to God in that third thing that he wants from us. And we're saying, hey, listen, I cannot get rid of this thing. I can't chop this tree down from last week. I can't get rid of this sin. I keep going back no matter how many times I try. And now I'm fasting from my heart to you because I need you to remove this. I need you to fix my marriage. I need you to make things right on my job. I need you to help me raise these children so that they don't go through the same things that I'm going through. I need you to change my heart because something inside of me is not right. And no matter how hard I try, I keep going back to square one. Verse 2 says... So when you give to the needy, who is the needy? Who is the needy? What's, what's the needy? So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets. As the hypocrites, Jesus begins to point at what? The heart. He says that those guys that go before everybody and they get the trumpets out and they make this huge announcement, they are hypocrites because it's not coming from their heart. They are doing righteous things, but the things that they're doing is so that they can be noticed. Lord have mercy. He says, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've already received their reward. So if you are doing all this thing to get something from God, you, you've, you're not going to get it. You've already got everything that you're going to get when you do it from the wrong heart. The heart is the most important part of worship, Period. Period. And listen, as a church, we are going to be a generous church. We're going to give. Jesus tells us to give. He says not only that we should give, he says when we give. He is assuming that as a church, that we're a giving church. Let me tell you something else, too. As individuals in this church, we're going to be givers. We'll be generous to the community. We'll be generous to each other. But the way we're going to do it is through lifting Christ up. We will never do it to lift ourselves up. We'll never do something in the community to grow the congregation. We do not want to grow that way, guys. We're never going to go out and do some service in the community or to help some family or be there for someone. 
wanting them to come back and then do something for us, we won't do it. And this is really groundbreaking stuff because there is nothing inside of you that makes you do this. Matter of fact, everything inside of you Darwin, look at all these different scientists and all these, these really smart people. Everything inside of you makes you want to do the opposite. It makes you only want to do stuff for people who what? Do stuff for, for you. And in the case that they haven't done anything for you, but if you know that they can do it for you, then you'll do something for them because that way you have a favor. And what, you know, that's what we call in America, one, one hand washes the other, or one, you, you, you scratch my back and I'll scratch your back. And what Jesus is telling us is, go to a man who has no hands and scratch his back. That's what he's telling us. Don't worry about who's going to scratch your back for scratching their back, but find a person who cannot scratch your back back, and that is the person that, you do, that you're to be generous to. Let's look at how, what it means to become a generous neighbor. Let's look in, in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. I'm going to just walk through these. I'm going to talk through this story. We're going to look at everything we can get out of this story. We're going to see some barriers to generosity in here. And we're also going to see what we need to do to become more generous. Verse 25 says, a teacher of the law came up and tried to trap Jesus. Now, he had no good intention. He was a law professional, a scribe, whatever you want to call him. He said, teacher, he asked. What must I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus answered him, what do the scriptures say? <laughs> and how do you interpret them? And I'm just going to throw this in for free. Listen, some people who are challenging you, some people who are trying to come against you and confuse you and what you should be doing and how you should be conducting yourself and how you should be worshiping God. You have to turn it back around on them and have them to explain what they believe and what they think. We spend too much time arguing with people and wasting too much time trying to change people. And what we need to start doing is presenting the Bible to them. And when they come to you and say, hey, I'm doing such and such. then you say, well, what do you think Jesus thinks about that? He says, the man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's exactly what Jesus showed us a few weeks ago. It's about heart worship. He says, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. You are right, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. So the man gets his right. I mean, he studied the scripture. He's a scribe. He's a lawyer. Of course, he knows exactly what he's talking about. He basically comes up to the same conclusion that Jesus comes uh, to. He says, first of all, we've got to love God with all of our heart. And then we've got to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. OK, A plus out the door. But he goes a little bit further. He says, but then but the teacher of the law wanted to justify himself. And let me tell you something. Anytime we get to that place where we're trying to justify what we're doing, we're trying to make what we're doing right, we're trying to, 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 to take the scripture and twist it, God will always convict our hearts. He says, so he asked Jesus, who is, who is my neighbor? Who, who is this person that I should be, you know, treating like myself? He, he skips past the first part, the whole part about worshiping God with all your heart. He skips past that because he's so righteous Within his own view, he thinks he's got it all together, right? Because he's doing everything right. He's raising his kids the way he should. He's, he's taking care of his wife the way he should. He's working the way he should in his mind. Skips past all that piece. Now, now, now of all these people out here, who, who, who should I consider to be my neighbor? Who, who should I? Because you don't want me to treat everybody like I treat myself. No. Jesus answered him. He says, there was... Once a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, where robbers attacked him, stripped him, and beat him, leaving him half dead. So he's talking about this Jericho road. I want to get there one day. I, I trust me, I want to get there one day. But, but basically, think about going to Asheville, one of those huge mountains. I think it's about 3,000, 3,000 to 4,000 feet above sea level. Um, is where Jerusalem is. Jericho's at the bottom. It's about a thousand below. 
b below sea level. So you're going up in the air and it's like a straight walk up. And it's a dangerous, dangerous road. I'm not sure how many of you guys have been to Asheville, been to the mountains. It is a very dangerous road. Lots of places to fall off. But more importantly, during that time, lots of places for robbers to hide. Lots of places for bad men to set up camp and, and, and you know, hurt you, bring damage and, and harm to you. He said, it so happened that a priest, a priest, was going down the road. But when he saw the man, he walked on by on the other side. He, not only did he, did he not help this guy, but he didn't want to be close to him. He saw this guy, he crossed the street and kept on walking. Now this is a priest. This is a man who understands the Bible. He would have understood that, to take care of his neighbor. And this guy in the scripture, if you look at the, at the, at the Hebrew and the Greek, he's a certain man. So that means he's a good man, probably a Jew. In the same way, a Levite, now the Levite, not, not the preacher, but more like the deacon in the Bible. They're the people that were responsible for taking care of stuff, kind of very similar to what our deacons do today. But he was a church going guy and he knew everything about the Bible. This Levite also came there, went over. He actually went over and looked at the guy. And he walked on by. He still went on the other side. So you got these two church people and, and they're, they're, they're high in their offices now. This priest is from the tribe of Aaron. I mean, he is the one that's sent to take care of us, to pray for us, to teach us. He knows the Bible inside and out. He looks at this man half dead and goes the other way. You've got this Levite from the, from the tribe of Levi. Still well versed in the Bible, understands everything in that Bible, knows that he's supposed to help this guy, and he, he doesn't help. And I begin to think about it. You know, I, I think that there's some barriers to generosity that we all struggle with, that we all have. And I think we can see these in the lives of these uh, two guys. First of all, the first thing I thought about is, is maybe these two guys, they may have thought that, and maybe this is going to take a lot of money to help this guy. I mean, he's half dead. More than likely, I'm going to have to give something out of my pocket. I'm going to have to come out of my pocket in order to help this person. They're not going to make it unless I can give them some infusion of cash. And, and, and so I think maybe these guys may have thought that the fear of the cost of helping this guy was too much. Now, this guy's half dead, and so it's going to take some time. You're going to have to, you're not, it's not going to be as easy as calling 911 during this time. They've got to stop for a period of time and do something and get this person somewhere. And I think that maybe if they were going somewhere, there may have been a fear of commitment. I've got to give up some of my time. I've got to give up some of, uh, of my ability. I've got to stay with this guy until he's well. They may have had a fear of danger because the same people who beat him up could have been hiding somewhere else, the same people who robbed him, or some new people. Matter of fact, it could have been an ambush, right? They could have put a guy out there that looked like he was half dead just for the, for the reason of having somebody stop by and then they get ambushed. But also, as they're going back and forth to the, to the temple, there might have been some fear of defilement. You know, if I get this blood on me, I've got to, I can't go and do my service. I'll be defiled and I don't want to get blood on my hands. And I begin to think about that. Aren't these the same things that stop us from being generous? Listen, there is something in your heart that God has shown you you should be working in. It's something that you probably have been through. God has saved you from it and you've not gotten into it. And one of the reasons that's stopping you from doing it, I can just about guarantee you, is either cost, commitment, danger or defilement. I can go down there and say those ladies that went, that's going through the same thing that I went through because if I get back down in that lifestyle, I might get pulled back in. I can't go down there and help those guys because of cost. I can't help this child who's going through the same thing that I went through growing up because I have to commit too much of my time. Let's go further in the story. He says, but a Samaritan. So you've got these, you've got these high officials a priest and a Levite who don't do anything. Now you've got this Samaritan. 
And, and the Samaritan would have been like the worst thing that Jesus could think of. The reason why the Samaritan is inside of this parable is because Jesus wanted something with some shock factor. And, and, and this in today's time would have been probably like Al Qaeda person or something like that. I mean, he would have been somebody that the Jews would have really detested. They would have done some things that would have inflicted some hurt and pain on the Jews. And he would have they would have just hated this guy. And so Jesus uses this Samaritan to make the point. He says, but a Samaritan. Who was traveling that way came upon the man. And when he saw him. His heart was filled with pity. And the Samaritan looks at this Jewish person who's beaten and half dead, and his heart goes to, the, to a place of compassion. He begins to think, I can't leave this guy here. I wouldn't want anybody to leave me here. I can't just walk by this guy. I've got to stop and do something. It says in, in verse 34, he went over to him. He poured oil and wine on his wounds and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own animal, probably the thing that he was riding on, and took him to the inn where he took care of him. What he begins to do is not only does he stop and have compassion, but he begins to act. He gets this guy up. He uses his own resources. This would have been stuff that he would have had for his trip. The wine and the oil would have been stuff that he would have needed for him all, his own self. If he bandaged this guy, more than likely he took his own clothes and ripped him. He gave from his heart. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. And the thing that jumped off the page to me is that he spent the night with this guy. He fully committed to making sure that this guy was taken care of. The next day, he gave two silver coins to the innkeeper. And I looked that up. I wanted to know what would two silver coins be in, in, in this day and time. And two silver coins would be the equivalent of one day's work. He said, take care of him. He told the innkeeper, and when I come back this way, I'm going to come back and check on him. I will pay you whatever else you spend on him. I'm going to give you a full day of my pay. But if that's not enough to take care of this person that I'm fully committed to, when I get back, I'll take care of you. And Jesus concluded. In your opinion, which of these three acted like a neighbor toward the man attacked by the robbers? Jesus flips his entire question around. It goes from who are my neighbors to what is a good neighbor? The teacher of the law answered, the one who was kind to him. Really, really what he's saying is? The one that treated him the way that he wanted to be treated, the one that saw him out there in distress and stopped and did whatever it took to get him up back on his feet to save his life. That's the one that's the good neighbor. That is the generous neighbor. That is who we are going to be as individuals. That is who we're going to be as a church. Jesus replied, you go then. And do the same. He, he says, now that you know what it means to be a good neighbor, now that you know what it means to be a good neighbor, now that you know what it means to be a good neighbor, we've been commanded to go out and do the same. As a church, that's what we're going to be. We're going to be good neighbors. We're going to lift Christ up through our generosity. We will not do it so, to grow this church. We will not do it to get as individuals, we're going to be generous. Husbands and wives, we're going to be generous with each other. Parents and kids, we're going to be generous with each other. Singles, we're going to be generous with the people around us. We're no longer going to think about us and what we want and what we can get. And we're going to put all our focus on bringing God glory through our generosity. This is what it's going to take. This is what we've got to do in order to become a generous church, in order for you to become a generous husband or wife, in order for you to become a generous single, a generous parent. 
This is what it's going to take. It's going to require you to act with compassion. Listen, that's too much going on around you. Now, you can't do everything and you can't fix everything, but there are things within your path. There are people laying on the side of the road in the same condition that you were laying in that need you, and it's time for you to act with compassion. It's going to require us to be willing to invest time in others, in other folks' kids. I know they're not your kids. Listen, it's bigger than your house. It's bigger than your kids. It's bigger than mama and them. Your call is to go out and be a good neighbor. It's to spread Christ through your actions and, and through the things that you do. It's to spread Christ through your generosity. That's going to require time from you. You've got to be willing to share your talent. You, you'll be surprised at some of the talent that's in this room right now. Some of the things that this church needs. I mean, there are things that the church needs. This church and the church in general needs that people are keeping. Let me tell you something. I drove by uh, a cemetery. And I looked over and God showed me a vision. And it was all types of stuff. And I, and I prayed on that for weeks. And God began to reveal to me, those are all the gifts that people took into the grave with them. They had books, there was art, there was songs. But instead of people allowing it to flow out of them by, through their generosity, a lot of people took a lot of their talents and abilities to the grave with them. And the final thing it's going to take, it's going to take some money. Now, I have money at the end. But I know it's the top for some people. But for each one of these things, there's something. There's some people who don't mind paying the money. I just don't want, don't call me. I don't want to spend no time. I don't want to go up there and volunteer. I don't want to read to no kids. But what I want you to do is I want you to have God to search your heart, to prick your heart, to see which of these areas are you not generous in? What are the areas in your life where you refuse to be generous? Is it with your time? Is it with your ability? Is it with your money? What we're going to do as individuals and as a church, we're going to attack those areas. Matter of fact, I'm going to, I'm going to push you to start dribbling with your left hand. See, some of you guys are right-hand dribblers, and, and you do everything with your right hand, and, and it's easy for you. You just write your tithes, check out, and, and it's done, but you don't want to come and serve at all. And some of you guys just, you want to serve and you, you're okay serving, but, but I don't want to give any of my money to anybody. And what it's going to take for us to be a generous church is for us to subscribe to the tithe. Not just for money, but for time and ability. So what is the reward? I always ask this question. Is the juice worth the squeeze? Because becoming generous, that's a lot of squeezing, guys. Some of you to separate yourselves from these areas where you have not been generous in the past. And listen, going back to what I said earlier, a lot of it is just the way you were raised. It's the things that you heard or what you saw. If you're a giver and you're a giving person, more than likely you've been around people who give. And, and if you're not so easily and not so generous, more than likely it is the result of, of that being modeled in your, in your life. But what is the reward? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It says, this is what you guys read in the response of reading. Now, the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food, talking about God, he will provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. See, when you're generous, God gives you more. I don't know if you know generous people, but I do know several of them, and they never run out of anything. Let me tell you something. I was talking with, with the mothers last night. There are two people that God has been showing me throughout my pastoring. There are people who won't give, and there are people who will give. But the amazing thing about this, and I don't care how many times it's presented in front of me, it always pans out this way. And my guess is if you really think about it, it pans out this way in your own life. People who don't give, whatever it is they don't give, never have enough of it. And people who give, whatever it is that, that we're talking about, always have enough. 
And what, 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 what Paul begins to show us is the one, God, the one who's actually giving the seeds out, that's actually handing out whatever it is that, that you've been asked to be generous with, that he actually gives to the person who's going to give more. You can't outgive God's giving. And, and that's why my grandmother, every time I think about it, she fed the entire community on a fixed income. Still doing it today. And it does not make sense to me how she keeps food in the cupboard. And you know somebody like that. You know somebody who has an unlimited supply of generosity. But, but, but not only will God provide you and multiply your seed and increase your harvest, you will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. Everything you do in this church, in the church, everything you do for Christ, everything you do for God, everything you do to help bring somebody to God, God's going to, he's going to bless you for that generosity. Verse 10 says, they will glorify God for your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with, with them and with others through the proof Provided by this service. I love, I love the way Paul says this. He says, because of your generosity, because you lift up, up Christ in a generous way, you, drew, you allow God to draw more people to him. You actually had some impact. You actually made a difference in some lives. Think about the people who've been generous to you and the impact that they've made. Some of us are here tonight because of people who were generous to us. He says, and they will have deep affection for you in their prayers on your behalf because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Not, not, not only are you going to help them out, but at, at, at some point, they're going to be back to help you out. Let's look at this. The rewards of generosity are very simple. First of all, the favor of God. Listen, there's nothing like being in God's favor. We do it because God tells us to do it, right? We do it because Jesus says when we do it, we're supposed to do it. We do it because the Bible instructs us to do it. And what we get out of it is favor. Listen, I've been under the curse. I've been under the financial curse. I've not always been a tither. I've been under the, the, uh, the at work curse when I couldn't figure out with the, the going crazy too much on my plate curse. I've been under all those curses. There's nothing that breaks those curses like generosity. Amen. There's nothing that breaks those curses like you giving of yourself, doing the thing that happens. And listen, when you get under God's favor, it's not that thing that, that just happens like tax time when you get an influx of money and everything. Oh, I'm in, under God's favor. And then by March or April, you're trying to figure it out again. No, it's, it's, it's real favor. It's real prosperity. It's things that really begin to happen. You begin to see real changes in your marriage, real changes at work, real changes with, with your children, real changes in your finance. It's real. The next thing you have is kingdom impact. Listen, all of us are here because of somebody. I can guarantee you, somebody who was generous to us, who made a difference in our lives. Very few of us are here because somebody told us to shut up, sit down, be quiet, or were prideful. It's kingdom impact is making a difference for the kingdom when you become generous. And the final thing that he shows us is you create this legacy. And it's real. It's not like at the job, you know, when you retire, you know how it is, and it's a big celebration. And then one year goes by and they mention you a few times and then the next year goes by and you, you've, you've seen it. And, and some of us put our entire heart into things that are not lasting. They're not legacies. Nobody will even remember us three years from now in the things that we're putting our heart. Some of us invest our money, our time, our commitment in things that mean nothing. But when you're generous for Christ, you create a legacy. So I want you to take this with you this week. You will see the God in me 
through my generosity. You will see the God in me because of my generosity. I'll talk to you for a second. I know this is hard, especially in your area. All of us has an area on those four. A place where we don't want to give, a place where we don't trust God enough to sustain us. That's primarily where it comes from. We don't trust God enough. But listen to me. Regardless of what area you struggle with on that list, God is going to put somebody in your, on your road. And listen to me. The way you're going to know who this person is, is going to be somebody who is going through the very thing that could have killed you, that could have pulled you down, that could have, that could have hurt you, the place where you were laying down. And I'm challenging you to act with generosity. I'm challenging you this week as God begins to reveal that person to you, that child, that adult, whoever it is, that person that needs you. Just like you needed somebody. That you act with generosity and that you hold back nothing from helping this person. Now, listen to me. As I begin to think about this Good Samaritan story and, and you know, we all want to be be Good Samaritans and everything. God began to speak to my heart about this one thing, and that is in a way we are very much like instead of the Good Samaritan that we're trying to be. We're actually the guy that was laying on the side of the road. Jesus is really the Good Samaritan in this story. And I know it's been taught this other way for so long because, you know, like I, I'm trying to get everybody to do to be generous. But but the reality of it is, the more I look at this, it's not a really a, a, as much of a generosity story as it is a salvation story. And what Jesus does is he sees us with beaten, with bloody, and we're as far away from him as the east is to the west. Right. But he takes the time to come and check on us. And he holds back nothing. Think about this. He allows himself to go all the way to death on the cross for us. He leaves us with everything that we need in order to get up, stand up on our own, to move forward. And what does Jesus ask the man? Go out and do, go out and do the same thing. Think, think about this for a second. How crazy would it be if we read the next part of the parable and it talks about this same guy that was picked up by somebody, taken care of, nursed back to health, is now walking down the same street and sees another man in the same position that he was in and walks right by him. We've all done it. We've all done it. But today is the day that we do it no more. Today is the day that we open our eyes, that we see the need, that we begin to address the need, that we become generous, that we begin to put people first. Then let me tell you what, what, what Jesus says here. We need to put God first. And then we need to treat the people around us. And that's everybody. That's Hindus, that's Muslims. That's Jewish people. That's black people. That's white people. I know we're in a very strange place politically. I, I know, I know it, it's impacting you. Trust me, it's impacting all of us. All the rhetoric, rhetoric that we're hearing, all the insults. But now is the time for the church to stand up and become a generous party, to open doors, to help anybody regardless of who they are, where they're from, what their background is. Don't worry about the cost. Don't worry about the commitment. Don't worry about being defiled. The only worry that we should have is, is the worry associated with trying our best to lift Christ up within this community, within our families, within our lives. To God be the glory. And send out to lift our voice and sing to the living God. To the living God. No one can deny. No one can deny that Jesus Christ.